Welcome to the Innovative Hotelier, brought to you by Hotels Magazine. I'm your host, Robin Tremingham. It goes without saying that the buzzword in the hotel development sector at the moment continues to be consolidation. But what's actually driving this trend? Is this, in fact, the golden age of travel in which hoteliers utilize technology to interpret and meet guests' expectations like never before? Or... Are high interest rates and economic volatility driving changes which largely ignore new traveler preferences? Join me now as I chat with Hotel Magazine's Editor-in-Chief, David Eisen, to try to decipher whether big brands are really listening to what travelers want and trends that will define the industry as we move into 2024. FOH is a global food service and hospitality company that manufactures smart, commercial-grade solutions. Headquartered in Miami, the company designs and manufactures all their restaurant and hotel products. They have showrooms and distribution centers located throughout the globe, and their products are always in stock and ready to ship from any of their distribution centers worldwide. Welcome, David. It's great to get a chance to catch up with you again. Robin, it's great to be back. It's my second time. Hopefully, I do better than better than the first time. We'll see. Oh, you, you were great the first time, so you set that. the bar pretty high for yourself. You're a very good liar. I appreciate that. Thank you very much. <laughs> no, not really. <laughs> um, so today we're chatting on a, about what's going on uh, in the business behind hotels. I guess. Yeah. You know, I think it's fair to say that the buzzword in the hotel development sector pretty much all this year has been consolidation. How much of this would you say is being driven by interest rate hikes? And what makes you say this? It's a great point. It's, it's, well, I would look at, I'm not so much, you know, I guess consolidation we're seeing. We've seen a little bit of consolidation within, 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 I kind of kind of in the uh, in third party management sector, we're waiting on more consolidation. Whether we saw this, we we've seen this play by uh, Choice Hotels uh, for Wyndham, which has kind of been you know all over. Well, I wouldn't say all over the news for the consumer, mm-hmm. but for us in in media in hospitality media, it's been all the rage, so to say, so to speak. It's kind of been this saga of, of back and forth, and uh, he said, she said, um, and as we sit here, what's today, November sixth? Yeah. It's still it's still kind of ongoing, uh, but so we're still seeing how that kind of is all kind of played out. But I think interest rates in general, I mean, they've, they've driven up cap rates. Um, it's made it harder for for hotel comp. Well, it's made it harder for people to build new hotels, right? So mm-hmm. uh, you have to be a little bit more kind of savvy with your with your cap stack if you're wh- where you're looking to get uh, debt from if you're looking to build. But there hasn't been a lot of kind of new development in that in that regard because it's 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 harder it, it, money used to be you know years when we had zero interest rates money was was free basically um nowadays you know you're looking at uh uh, uh and i'm no finance uh, uh guru but you're looking at uh cap rates that are higher than uh interest rates which makes it kind of difficult um to, to build to build new new products and what we're seeing then is that a lot of hotel companies right the way that they kind of um the way that they kind of grow, right, is by net unit growth. So it's it's harder to add new units, new rooms, new hotels um, when people aren't building hotels because that's what it's like a shark. They can never stop sleeping. They always have to keep moving forward. Um, so what a lot of them have relied on now uh, from Hilton and Marriott, IHG all the way through are looking at conversions where mm-hmm. it's basically like, you know, a hotel comes up for um, relicensing or it goes through a transaction and it's unencumbered. They want to get their name on the door, right? Because it's and it's obviously it's, it's quicker to do that to convert a hotel to a new brand than it is to build a new hotel. So a lot of hotel companies are really focused on that, focused on conversions. I think you know even in Hilton's Q3 and, and uh, Marriott's Q3 number earnings call, they're talking about thirty percent of their new openings um, are conversions. Hilton launched this uh, brand Spark by Hilton, which I'm actually going to attend. The second opening of one, it's going to be in Germantown, Maryland. The first one, I believe, was in Connecticut, in Mystic, Connecticut. But they're opening a second one in, in Germantown, Maryland, which is very close to where I live. 
um, that'll be presided over by Chris Nesetta, who's the CEO of Hilton. And, you know, if you, if you get the CEO there, I think it really matters. This mm -hmm. brand matters to Hilton because it's really an easy way to kind of keep generating uh, new hotels uh, th through that conversion model. So I think that's something we're going to continue to see um, moving forward until maybe, the, you know, the Fed backs up on interest rates. But we could be in a higher interest rate um, environment for, for longer than maybe people would like. You know, I think you're making a fair point uh, when you talk about the conversions. How much of this, though, do you think is sort of a knee-jerk reaction to the state of the market, the state of borrowing? And how much is actually really like strategic, long-range development planning at work? I think I, I think it's something that is 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 not a fad, but it will continue to be a, a, a trend. And especially when we're looking at the mid-scale segment. Now, that's where a lot of the hotel companies are really focused now. It's not, you know, they all have, well, not all of them, but, you know, they have luxury product up or upscale. Those types of hotels, you, you don't see many too, conver too many kind of uh, conversions on um, at the luxury level of, 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 the, of, the, of the segment. But we're seeing it a lot in, in the mid-scale segment, um, the select service segment. That's where a lot of the focus is now. When you see all these new brands that are popping up from, you know, your, your normal kind of mid-scale brand um, segments called premium premium economy, which didn't even which didn't even wasn't even around two years ago, but now it's a buzzer premium economy. We're seeing mid-scale extended stay. That's really where like the develop the, the the brand focus is now. It's really kind of down, I guess, you, kind of uh, down market. You would say so. That's really where, where the kind of focus is now. Um, I, I don't think it's a fad. I think I think hotel companies are going to continue to push that. They go where the market goes. I mean, it, and I think a lot of these hotel companies um, are are typically ahead of the curve. Maybe not so much ahead of the curve when it comes to technology and the tech stack. That's what everyone talks about. But especially development brand people, they're very savvy people. I know these people. They're they're ahead of the curve, and they can see it coming. And they know that in this higher interest rate environment, where it's going to be harder to build new hotels um they are all fighting for a lot of the, they're all fighting a lot for the same owners the same developers the same franchisees um so it's it's really kind of an arms race and it's all about how to how to get that uh what they call that that nug going forward net unit growth and i think conversions especially down to the mid-scale segment that's where you're going to continue to see the growth yeah, when I hear the phrase premium economy, all of a sudden I'm thinking about how the airlines uh, price their seats. Yeah. And it seems like every time you turn around, you know, there's all these different subsections of how you can book and when they'll let you on the plane and all of that kind of stuff. It's a um, good point. I think I think that the hotel industry has long been, if you go to a lot of conferences, people will say, why aren't we taking, why doesn't the hospitality industry, or hospitality, hotel industry, take more of a, a, a an approach like that um which you know if to, to you know if you don't want to use a euphemism it's basically nickel and dying people right so it's kind of like you know i'll charge you to and that's the whole thing with resort fees the junk fees that everyone is talking about um charging you for um kind of these a la carte services that you used to think were just part of part of your stay yeah. now you know it's interesting but let's be honest. I mean, the hotel industry is is certainly different from the airline industry, which is very much like down to every penny and 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 optimizing this, optimizing that. I mean, the hotel industry obviously it's gotten much much more um, expert in revenue management that kind of thing. But I think it also comes down to it's always still um, no matter we talk about AI technology, it's still a one on one kind of you know in your uh, face to face business. Um, actually, I remember I think. I don't know. Maybe I'm making this up. But I think Bill Marriott. I, I I I had the pleasure of speaking at once years ago. But the hospitality industry, you know, it's it's not about nickel and diamond. They don't charge. A lot of these hotels will still give it to you gratis because that's what hospitality should be. You know what I mean? It's not about finding ways to ch keep charging people for this and that. But I do think there are a lot of hotels out there. Um, as kind of things evolve, we'll take more of a tech kind of approach and a lot of that will come with kind of like to your point the kind of the premium economy or, or charging for this charging for that um but i at the same time i think it also when you do do things like that it gives it gives more power to the to the consumer as well so we're you know i'd love to be able to go on a website and you know how many times have you have you made a reservation at a hotel um 
you have no idea which room you're going to get. I mean, how cool, and, they, and, and invariably for me, because I had the best luck in the world, every time for some reason I check into a hotel, they give me the room right next to the elevator, which is always, you know, opening and shut at two o'clock in the morning. And there's a lot of people. So like to be able to give the control to the consumer to choose not only the type of room, but like where in in the in the in the physical plant to have it. Now I know that's more difficult with the way that housekeeping is and cleaning rooms and getting them ready. But I think things. It, I think if if you put control in the in within the consumers kind of reach, they'll pay for it if they're able to kind of really customize their experience when it comes to that. Um, so that yeah, that, that that's kind of how I see it. But it's it's a good point about the airlines. You know, I think that. Actually, you're really on to something. If you, you know, if, when the hotels get to the point where the con- customer can choose their room, I yeah. mean, that's what we've all wanted all along. Yeah, it's, it's control. interesting, yeah. though, to think about whether the hotels themselves, the brands are actually listening to what the customers want or not in the midst of all of this. I was looking at one of the brand new, I'm going to call it sub brands. And I'm not going to call them out by name because what they were actually promoting was a very plain room that was Mm -hmm. so plain, it doesn't even have a coffee maker. But the selling feature was, oh, but we have a 24 hour, uh, you know, coffee shop Alice yeah. Starbucks kind of place in the lobby. And we also have a 24 hour bar. Right. Right. You know, I don't know about you, but I'm sort of powered by caffeine. And if somebody said to me that yeah. I, I wasn't going to get a coffee maker in my room, yeah, uh, I'd be like, next. The That's... idea, of, I'm not, go- you know, at my age, I'm not yeah. going down to the lobby to get right. my coffee and my PJs. That's yeah. just not going to happen. So that's, that's it. Okay. So I'll push back on that only because I think it's, but, but I think it's good that I push back on it because it's totally preference. Sure. Yeah. So for me, you know, the only coffee, okay. The only coffee makers I will use in a hotel room that I have before are like the Nespresso ones with the pods. Okay. Those are like a nice amenity to have. Um, knowing what I know, there are many, there are a couple things in the hot, in the, in the hotel room that never get clean. And I'm assuming guessing a lot of those time it's a coffee maker. So I wouldn't, I'm not even a person who's going to get the water from the bathroom, put it in the, in the, in the, in the, in the cylinder in the back. Um, but I'm also like a coffee. I love, I love coffee. Right. So, you know, every morning I grind it, I do the pour over thing. It, it takes longer, but it's kind of like a, a, a ritual. Mm-hmm. Um, I would never, and I, and it's funny cause I, I, I was, I was reading someone's, um, I think it was a LinkedIn post talking about the same, the very same thing that they were booking a hotel and like they saw or, or they showed and there was no coffee maker in the room but for me that would never but it's different for other people it would never be a deciding factor for me i could care less if there's a coffee maker in in the room but to your point you want to be able to get up go through that and not have to you know go downstairs to get the coffee but it it, and this is kind of a um a little bit of a a tangent but but to your point about this sub brand and i'm I, i won't i won't try to guess it on on air i could um sure you could you know everybody well but the, the, this gentleman on LinkedIn was making a good point that there, I, I think that there are brands out there or or hotels out there that really should focus on doing maybe a couple things really, really well, really well, whether it's like make they have the best coffee, right, that, in their coffee shop, or they have some kind of amenity or service. They, I don't know off the top of but they do they do a couple things really, really well. And that really, I think, makes you distinct from others, right? That might mm-hmm. be trying to be doing everything to everyone and being generally okay at everything, you know? But if like, for instance, like if I, sometimes people go to a restaurant because they know it has the best, you know, vegetarian lasagna, this side of the Mississippi. And that's the one thing they do really, really well. Everything else might not be fantastic. It might be kind of blah, blah. But they go there because they know that there's that one special thing there. So, you know, if I was building a hotel today, which I'm not, because, again, it's too expensive to build hotels nowadays. We already we already talked about this. Talked about this. But if I was doing something like that, I would really my, I would focus my brand on being able to do to be able to deliver a couple or a few really exceptional things and let everything else kind of fall fall in line from there. But 
yeah, coffee. I know coffee is such a such a uh, such an issue for everyone. I know it's, but you know, for me, I, I'll I'll put on a hat, maybe not a pajama, put on some sweatpants, and go down to the the coffee bar um, <laughs> to grab a cup in the morning. So well. I can agree with you that coffee is a very controversial subject for everybody. In all of this, though, to what extent, when they make these decisions, do you think the brands are really listening, actually, to what their customers are saying? And to what extent do you think they're just kind of like um, crowd following? Oh, this brand and that brand are doing this, so we better do it, too. Yeah, I mean, they say they are every time you hear that. Oh, we we listen to our customers and and they put out surveys. Um, you know, part of part of a loyalty program is supposed to be able to track these preferences of people, right? So, I mean, that's a whole other debate: uh, loyalty programs and, and the kind of the the efficacy of them, whether they really do what they're set out to do. Because, um, I mean, I'm not like a prolific traveler. Like, I have friends who travel. You know banker guys friends of mine who who are traveling hundreds of hundred days a year um and they go to the same hotel and even so when they go to the same hotel every time it's like oh it's not you know welcome back mr mr fox it's like oh it, it's almost like the trend like they've never been there before right so i think hotel companies say they're listening whether they're not i'm not really sure um but 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 they should be listening to their to their customers i think they they do, but at the other side of that, they have to listen to their developers, their owners. I don't know what's more important, their franchise, the franchisee or, or the customer, right? I mean, th- there's a, that's another 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 good debate because hotels, you know, Marriott's, the Hilton's, the IHG's, the Choices, when they build hotels for customers, they also build them. They, I'm sorry, they build brands for customers. They also build brands for the people who are going to be actually putting the money behind them, the owner. Hmm. Um, and more and more, as you know, it's all about how to increase profit margins for, for owners. Mm-hmm. And sometimes that means stripping things out. So while you might think that coffee maker, there's a cost to that. There's a cost to everything in a hotel. So even pulling out a coffee machine in, say, a 200-key hotel or um, you know, removing, you know, nowadays the, the trend in these kind of these more kind of lifestyle boutique, even you know, there's so many names now. Lifestyle, you can have a lifestyle boutique hotel. That's a mid mid scale hotel. But you know, there's no there's no door on the closet anymore, right? So everything's open, right? There's a cost to that. Um, my funniest thing is uh, going to hotels that um, that have a shower, but they only have the, the half glass door. Have you? Seen, it's more in Europe. There's many. Oh. It's like, they just forgot. To, they're like, you know what? We're just, and then the water gets everywhere. So it's like the worst. Ex- it's literally that that that's I think that's the perfect example for me is like so the the showers that have half glass doors. Right. So the, the 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 back half is open to everything. It's the most uncomfortable showering experience. A water gets everywhere. And I'm guessing the back of my head. So like I can't imagine any any guests being like, oh, this is a great experience. Like for me, I like to be enclosed. I want the steam everywhere. Right. But I guess maybe they're like, okay, it's cheaper to do a half glass door than than a full one. So we'll just stop there. I Uh, I guess part of it's cultural. You're making me remember. Have you ever been to one of the old school, small European hotels where there's no glass, there's no shower curtain at all? And it's like there's 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 no no shower nozzle. And supposedly the floor is going to slope towards the drain and you're going to have your seat's going to stay dry. Well, of course that never happens. Yeah. I had this one experience. Oh gosh, it was a long time ago, but not only did everything in the bathroom got soaked, I had my roommate who I was traveling with hammering on the bathroom door. I'd flooded half the bedroom and I didn't yeah. even know. Yeah. And I, I you know, the cost you might save for doing the half the half glass door you might lose because of all the mildew and cleanup you have to do. You have to call uh, serve. Oh, you know, can't program. even think. Yeah, I actually was once at a, in a in a bathroom that actually had the same thing you're talking about. No, no curtain, no shower curtain, no anything, and the floor was carpet. I mean, it's just like yeah, and I, yeah, it's just, I, maybe it's a European. I guess it's a European thing. They like to be uh, maybe us Americans. We like to be enclosed. I like to be ensconced. Is that the word? I, I, I can't even imagine. Maybe we're supposed to know that, oh, no, no, you don't really use the shower. 
You right, just look right. at maybe. Yeah, I mean, it's like <laughs> kind of like maybe it's like it's like an anachronism, like a bidet. Like, no, who uses it? Well, yeah, I don't know. Bidets, I think, are actually making a comeback. Not not so much for me, but I hear there uh, a lot of people are are into bidets now. But it, it, it but it goes back to your point. The problem is, is that not the problem. But it's like everyone is unique, and everyone mm-hmm. has different. And it's hard to when you're building out a brand. You know, it used to be every Marriott looked the same, no matter if you were in, you know. Oh, that was their thing. Yeah, you that had was that their thing. Sort that of was orange carpet everywhere right. you went, and that's how people liked it. Yeah, um, but now everyone thinks. Well, everyone in the world is like, you know, I'm I'm unique, and in my in my likes and dislikes are going to be different from that person's likes and dislikes, and that's true. I mean, that's what makes that's what makes a human being. It's like I like to wear this. Mm-hmm. Someone else likes to wear that. I like to eat this. I don't. So, but I mean, so when you're building a new, a new brand, it's it's very hard to be to be everything to everyone. Going back to my point, be really good at a couple things. You know, I I think you're really onto something there because you know, on the one hand, you have I'm going to call it the old school four to five star luxury property that gives you everything, and then on the other extreme, you have the Japanese capsule hotels where you don't get anything, but they have yeah. all these vending machines on right. the floor, and you yeah. can pick and choose. I want a toothbrush. I don't need a towel. I need a this, and you just get the what you need in an odd way where I'm not really pushing the capsule hotel concept. I like that idea that instead of having to travel with every last amenity in the world, because you never know what the hotel will or will not have when you get there, that you can really easily pick and choose just what you need. Yeah. It's like, it's like the old automats. Remember those? Like, well, yeah. Dating myself. I, I'm too young to actually remember those. I will say that. Oh, yeah. Okay. But, uh, I, I watched a documentary, I think, with Mel Brooks. He did one on, on automats. But I, it goes back to the idea of like when you travel, you're in control of what you you're if what you want and what you don't want. Now there are people like for me, luxury hotels are fantastic. I mean, I I love who doesn't love a luxury hotel, but along every, you know, along the way there, it's like sometimes the um the uh, service is maybe too salacious, like on top of you for everything. Like I, I'm not, you know, it's funny. Like you get out of the car or taxi or Uber and you have like a little bag with you and the guy's grabbing it. Let me take that yeah. for you. And it's not that I don't sure. Or, or my, even my luggage fine. But it's like, it, it, you know, I can, I can get it myself first of all, cause I'm not, you know, feeble yet, but there's always like that annoying kind of like, okay, you check in where, where are my bags? You're kind of flustered. I don't have my bags on me. Something, spe- something really might need is in there. You go, ch- and this is, this is my biggest pet peeve checking in, going up to my room and where are my bags? They're not there. And I'm sitting around waiting 20 minutes. I want to go grab for a an hour. Yeah. yeah. And your bags are up there where I could have just done this on my own. But for some reason I gave it over to them and then they come up and then you have to go through the song and dance. How much do I, you know, tipping. It's just, you know, luxury can, can be a little luxury can sometimes be too much or overbearing. Sometimes you really want that, but you know, maybe for a corporate, you know, a, a business transient, you know, someone who's just in and out and doesn't want all that. Um, it, it can be a little bit, a little bit overbearing, but you know, the, that's, that's the great thing about travel. You you can make it what you want, but I, to your point, a capsule hotel. I mean, when you hear capsule too, I'm, I'm, and I've stayed at these two, like a pod hotel, they do things really well though, but your room is, you know, the size of uh it's, it's, it's a bed basically in there. Yeah, you basically. Around. You're not going to be able to do, you know, your, your, uh, your, your yoga routine, uh, your calisthenics in the morning, whatever you might do, uh, it, 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 it can be tiny, but, um, but people, but if you know that going in, then, you know, you're prepared so for it. Yeah. You're prepared for it. Correct. So in all of this, if I asked you, you know, which brand is actually listening to their customer, does anybody stand out to you? Oh, wow. You're putting me on the spot that I don't want to exclude uh, anyone. Um, well then, give me a couple. I'll, say, I'll put it this way: It's interesting on Hilton's call, their their Q three call. Um, and let's just, and I I will say this about you know earnings calls are just are really are, are great to listen to for any kind of industry because you get to hear kind of the CEO speak and you get people and 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 you know there's the Q and A session where they're kind of put on the spot. Um, CEOs are the best marketers of their hotel of their hotel companies. Like the, they're like the the chief marketing officer. They're, they're the best person who's going to talk. You know, nothing is ever 
nothing is ever bad or, 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 uh, it's always optimism, which I think is, Mm -hmm. is important first of all for them. Um, but like, for instance, Hilton made it very clear, and this is kind of listening to their subset, right? They don't have a luxury, we'll call it, they call it luxury lifestyle brand, right? So they have at the high end, they have their, their Conrad, they have their Waldorf, um, which, you know, that's their that's their luxury end tier. When they have Alex R, which are really beautiful, nice hotels too. But they don't have like a St. Regis. They don't have a Ritz-Carlton. Um, but that's pure luxury. What they don't have is what you would call luxury lifestyle. Mm-hmm. I always equate with W, the W brand, which was kind of like the a seminal brand in the space, you know, started by Starwood, now obviously owned by Marriott. Whenever, whatever. Or yeah, however, whenever, whatever. Always- but um, and they've and they've gotten to scale with that, right? So, but but Hilton doesn't have one, so they're they've made it a promise that they're going to launch one in a new brand to fit that space in 2024. Because by listening to their to their guests and Kristen Stead, their CEO, was talking about how we don't have a brand to give them, so we're losing market share, we're losing out on customers. We're not only losing out on customers, we're losing out on potential developers who want to build these luxury, be in this luxury lifestyle space. So I think um, in terms of like amenities and, and services and, and all that, yeah, but I think it's important these hotels, they're they're listening to their to their constituents in regards to what they what they need to be in the market with because they don't want to um, lose out and capture that potential uh, market, which Hilton to their um, you know being frank frankly was saying to, to to not only you know us journos but to the investment community that they're they're literally losing out on money and that's why they're putting they're putting um they're putting out this kind of new brand in the lug to fit that luxury lifestyle space so for, in that case they're listening to their they're listening to their guests and what they want established in 2002 FOH is a woman-owned global food service and hospitality company that manufactures smart, savvy, commercial-grade products, including plateware, drinkware, flatware, hotel amenities, and more. Driven by innovation, FOH is dedicated to delivering that wow experience that restaurants and hotels crave, all while maintaining a competitive price. All products are fully customizable, and many are also created using sustainable, eco-friendly materials such as straws and plates made from biodegradable paper and wood and PBA-free drinkware. FOH has two established brands, Front of the House, focused on tabletop and buffet solutions, and Room360, which offers hotel products. Check out their collections today at FOHWorldwide.com. Let's um, change the subject here a little bit and go back to something that you alluded to very briefly earlier in our conversation. Uh, for weeks, it seemed, at least to me, like the choice Wyndham merger was essentially a done deal. You know, everybody was talking about how this was absolutely going to happen. Yeah. And then a week or two ago, we had Wyndham's earnings call and most of the call, I understand, was devoted to explaining why the board rejected, you know, what was essentially a $10 billion bid. What's your take on this situation? I mean, it's 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 great. It's great drama. I'll, I'll, I'll say that, first of all. Um, what interesting in the Wyndham call, the Q3 call, so Stephen Holmes is the chairman of the board at, at Wyndham. He hadn't been on an earnings call for like something like six years. So it was kind of like, you know, uh, he's he's making this kind of like re- valiant return. Um, they are basically, I mean, that you know, Choice came out with an initial offer; it was rebuffed. They came out with another offer, it was rebuffed. I think it came out with a third, ninety dollars a share, or whatever it was. And Wyndham was basically saying, and Wyndham was basically their, their position was, look, you know, that 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 offer um, isn't it? Well, they didn't even say it's enough. They're like, we we we're better as a solo company. Basically, we don't need Choice. Basically. Um, is what is what they were saying. Um, and then it obviously got out in the open and everyone was kind of like going, you know, volleying back back and forth. But Stephen Holmes is just very, very, very candid with him. It was like, we're we're not, we're we're not, we're we're looking, we 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 don't believe this offer is in the interest of our sh- best interest of our shareholders. 
our franchisees. So for 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 a litany of reasons I w- that I won't even get into, um, but it, I I don't know where it goes from here. I I don't think it's it's definitely I don't think it's it's over per se. I always thought that maybe you know because behind the scenes you don't really know, but is you know could it be posturing by Wyndham to just keep cranking the price up, right? I mean, who no one takes the first offer, right? It's always like you know they made an mm-hmm. offer. Yeah, but obvi- but here's the thing though. Obviously, there was some sort of inkling of potential for this deal happening because we know from re- from you know it's out in public that Wyndham was taking meetings with you know Stephen Holmes was speaking to Pat Patius, the CEO of of Choice. So if they if he never if Wyndham never had a kind of um, uh, an inkling to potentially do a deal, then they probably would have never taken the meeting. Now I think you have I guess. You know, um, when when M and A mergers and acquisitions come up like this, and there is some kind of offer on the table, you have to listen to them because you're a publicly traded company, and you know, you're not doing what's best for yourself; you're doing what's best for the shareholders, right? Um, right. So, and but it's interesting, Stuart Bainham, who's the whose father created Choice Hotels. I was uh, there's a friend of mine in the industry, and he was and he he actually worked for both Choice and Wyndham at two separate times, obviously not not at the same time. But he told me that Stuart Bainham is a kind of is the kind of guy that if he sets his sights on something, uh, normally he's not going to lose out on it, right? So, I think there's still kind of um, it's been a little bit quiet. I mean, I, I I don't know if you you put the word it's un, unequiv that that Wyndham has unequivocally said no to this deal, um, but there could be another there could be another offer coming out that's higher than than the initial ninety dollar per share kind of bid. Um, but I, I, right now it's kind of like at a standstill and who knows where, and who knows, who knows where it will, it will go from here. Interestingly enough, the biggest deal, another big deal came down the shoot this morning with, you might've seen it. Hilton grand vacations, um, is going to, looks to be acquiring uh, blue green vacations, vacation ownership, $1.6 billion deal. Um, and interestingly enough, blue green had a marketing alliance with choice. So now Hilton's acquiring that business um in the in the kind of vacation rental rental uh, uh segment so there's there's you know deals are happening obviously but the one the big one choice kind of winning the one and I, I had written about this before like we haven't seen a mega mega deal like this since really when when marriott acquired starwood some mm-hmm. i think it was what seven years ago um that was that was a huge deal so uh and there was always talk about i think it was um i think it there was there was always inc- the rumors of IHG acquiring maybe Wyndham, but that was everyone talked about during like NYU conferences of the past that never happened. Um, so who knows what'll be? I mean, I think obviously there's um, people on both sides of the aisle who have their uh, either support of it or not. It's a lot of the um, the Asian American Hotel Owners Association, which is an, an or- a membership organization that that represents some you know. 20,000, they have like 20,000 members. Um, their owners own 60% of the hotels in the U S and it's, and, it, and a lot of them are in that Wyndham and choice kind of mid-scale economy segment. Now, if those two, if, if choice acquires Wyndham, you know, will that, and that was one of the, one of the issues that was that Stephen Holmes and Jeff Bellotti brought up the CEO when could that even pass the, you know, get through the, um, uh, through, uh, the FTC. Yeah. Trust reasons, right. Yeah. A monopoly of economy hotels out there, um, and you know, giving choice the power, you know, such having such power around How so big is too yeah, big, exactly. I, you know. So, absolutely. Yeah. So, who even knows if that a deal like that would get through? So, we'll see. Yeah, it's an interesting time. Um, I was reading about the lodging conference that just took place in September. Everybody there seemed to have been talking about the golden age of travel. So despite all this swirling economic uncertainty, what do you think? Is this the golden age of travel or, you know, where are we? I mean, what really is the golden age of of travel? I mean, I, I, when I think of the golden age of travel, I think it is almost like something in the, in the the halcyon years of the past where, you know, um, I, I, I hear golden age of travel and I see kind of uh, Pan Am up there and those like seats were like these big seats and, and they were in the, the dining cart came through and they were cutting off prime rib 
Um, you know, and had a full and, meal with wine. Yeah, yeah, full meal, having a cigarette afterwards. And, and this was in and this was a normal economy seat. This was like, you know, <laughs> that's how I anyway, that's how I envisioned the golden age of travel. And and as we do know now, uh that doesn't exist anymore, at least in the airlines, or unless you're you know ponying up, you know, 20, 20 grand to sit in uh sit in first Net class. Jets. Yeah. Right. So um I know that. Just from the numbers, I mean, Expedia they um, they uh, delivered their earnings today. Tr- travel demand is still, you know, breaking records. People are traveling. Whether this is a hangover from COVID, I don't know. Now, leisure travel is is booming. It's still, it still really is. People are people are on the road. Um, you know, the whole leisure idea, I think, it still has steam because I think people are now that a lot of people we are talking about this work remote. They can be in a different. They can still work, but be in a different country, be in a different state, which means they need to stay somewhere. So they need accommodations mm-hmm. to do so. Um, corporate travel on the transient side is definitely not back. If you listen to the, you know, Peter Kern from Expedia was talking about on, uh, on CNBC this morning that it hasn't reached back to pre-COVID levels. Um, yeah, yeah, but that's... I'm going to push back on that one a tiny bit because I sure. was reading this morning that an uh, American Lodging Association survey says business travel is making the fastest recovery this year of all sectors. It might be making a recovery. And I don't know if they're talking about group or they're talking about just the corporate kind of uh, the transient traveler, the one off. Maybe it is make I, I it certainly is coming back. I'm just not so sure it, it, it it's coming back the same as robustly or in the same way it was before before COVID. I, we all hope it does. Um, it's not. It's, I don't think it's back to 2019. No, it's not. It's not to 2019. But it seems yeah. to be like on the rise generally. I think. I think everything's on has to be on the rise because we came from such a we came from the nadir. Everything everything's going to go up up from here. Now, well, I will say that conferences are certainly back. I think people. I think conferences are back. Maybe not the well, you know, I, I the ones I've attended are back to where they were, you know, bef- they're mm-hmm. still getting record breaking numbers. So I think a lot of people are like, I want to get back, you know, not even it's not even getting by the road. They want to they want to meet face to face again. Like it's instead of mm-hmm. you know, it's great seeing you, Robin, over through a screen, but it'd be great to be in Bermuda with you, you know, wearing some Bermuda khakis and enjoying a round of uh, polo. I don't know. Uh, well, doing this interview on the terrace with the ocean yeah. in the background. Yeah, the, the I Fairmont, agree. At the Fairmont in Bermuda or whatever, or whatever that the property is there. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I, I think conferences are back. It's just, um, you know, the uh, it's just a different it's just a different era. I mean, look at look. Everything's changing. I think when you look at commercial real estate, you look at the office segment. I was reading, you know, offices are getting trying to get reconverted uh, into 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 multifamily and apartments, right? Into residential. So, so if people aren't going back to the office, it, it's just a, it's a whole different dynamic, and a lot of this spills over into travel. Um, you know, there's the opportunity of of taking a lot of these spaces. Um, I, I and and I, I I'm sorry to go on these segues, but like you know. I think the entire downtown corridors, the great cities across America are going to be going through this trans, like this transformation, right? Mm-hmm. To becoming, they used to be a locus of of commerce and business, and you know, people meet that kind of thing. I think a lot of these cities are going to go through this rebirth, where it's like instead of that, it's going to be more about like uh, almost like um, a cultural shift. It's about like these cities becoming places where people live, right? Um, you know, there's the big diaspora into the suburbs. Yeah. Now people are going to come back to the cities, but because these cities are going to be going to be changed to places where like you want to, you want, you want to have a family and you want to raise a family there. I don't know. Things are, things are are changing at a velocity. And I think a lot of it has to do with what coming out of COVID and, and, um, and, and, and just the, the kind of the reshuffling of the deck. And a lot of that will, a lot of that will be how we use, how we use and how we kind of, um, uh, we integrate with space. Yeah, I think you're right. I mean, we do seem to be at the nexus of this really big shift, not just in how we work, but in how we live. Yeah. You know, I, the, I don't know about you, but the generation that I was raised in, I mean, everybody had a single family home. You right. know, well, and good, good luck trying to buy one now. I mean, yeah, you know, the interest rates. Two and a half million. Like, yeah. yeah. It, that's the thing, though. It's like you look at, um, I mean, interest rates are high. So, you know that that's one strike against you and plus everything is too darn expensive anyway for like you know if you want to if and i don't like doing the whole like cohorts millennials gen, i mean i'm a gen i don't own a home right it's you know 
come up with 20% on a $500,000 home. That's a, that's a, that's a big nut, you know, to save up for when you mm-hmm. look at like the cost of living everywhere elsewhere. Um, so it, it, yeah, home ownership, I think when, you, you know, when my parents were coming up, it was something that was really within with not easy grasp, but easier to comprehend, you know, to get, to buy a home, you could buy a home for like hundred thousand, hundred fifty thousand dollars $150,000. Now you see homes out there, especially if they're in, in a locations that, you know, tiny two bed millions of dollars. Yeah. So, you know, it's expensive to do that. So something when it's that expensive to do and it's more harder to finance and get, you know, 30 year mortgage, whatever it is, 15 year mortgage, it makes you kind of rethink the way we live. But everything is really in the midst of space. Do individuals need, do families need? Is it more important to be able to have and drive a big car, you know, in this age of energy crisis and sustainability? Or is it more important to be able to walk to work? Yeah, you know, I think I I mean, all these are all very salient points in what it comes yeah. down to. I mean, people are. I mean, if you look at the re, the res, the multifamily space, um, especially you know, I live in I live in uh, Bethesda, Maryland. Every apartment building that is a new build apartment building or a, a reconversion or something else, the, the the spaces are getting smaller and smaller. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? People are living in smaller spaces. I mean, listen, go to Asia. I mean, they look at Hong Kong, places like that. And you know what I'm talking about, but I do find it interesting. It's just a, you know, sometimes you go, you know, you, you're driving along, you see these huge houses and it's like, you know, it, it, is a football team living there? You know, it's probably like four people. I'm like, do they need yeah. that much space? Why? Why? I mean, it's just, it's ins- anyway. So um, I think things are kind of like, it's not, things are becoming more compact. Um, but I, I, you know, depending where you live. I guess. So in all of this, do you see specific regions or markets where you think there's significant shift going on within the hotel industry as we look towards 2024? It's a good question. I mean, well, you know, there's the focus. Obviously, everything was depleted. When I go back to COVID. It'd be, it'd be great when we don't have to talk about, talk about COVID anymore. Just like, you know, you know. No, no one was talking about the um, the Spanish flu in two thousand in two thousand you know yeah. two thousand eighteen right and that was a hundred years prior so maybe maybe it's going to take a century before no one is going to be talking about COVID anymore um, but I'll be long gone by then um, so I, I think um, I don't know d- downtown is still I, I think downtowns are all they they they're going through a renaissance like we, we talked about before. Mm-hmm. Um, but a lot of, I think a lot of the new brands that are coming out, a lot of the new development is coming in these tertiary markets, secondary tertiary markets that are outside the, but I think that we're seeing like, there's a lot of, you know, you know, where I live, it's like, you know, we're a suburb of DC, but things are getting more and more urban as you go farther and farther out. Now you have these rings around these cities and it's like, now it's like, oh, well, a, a city, a, a, a town I never would have gone to growing up. Now it's like this cool, cool area and people are moving out there. And maybe that and that's what it was. It, people go where kind of where people are migrating to. And that's where development should go to. So it's like if more pe- if it if if a town is, is seeing growth there, that's the you know, the development community kind of follows these trends and builds builds there. And then I think brands are getting put out that kind of serve the those markets. So um yeah, I I I, I couldn't tell you exactly where, where it is. I mean, we saw, you know. The leisure markets kind of we saw markets boom right during COVID and post-COVID. Even people are still traveling, but they were going to kind of resort areas and things like that away from the cities. Um, so I don't know. I think there's going to be just this whole kind of uh I still think there's going to be this reshuffling of, of the deck and how we kind of how we um you know how we uh, uh what, what's the word I mean look for integrate with space and things like that. Um, and I think there will, will be kind of these these markets that we never thought um, would be anything, but they they just they they you know look at like Long Island City in New York, mm-hmm. I used to Queens. I mean, Long Island City was like a, a desolate place, but you know, right? It's I mean, from a location standpoint, you're right across the river from Manhattan, um, and it's booming now as it is, and you know, 
farther stretches of Brooklyn and Queens and wherever it is, it's like, those are just, those are going through these kind of, um, um, uh, it's another topic, gentrification, which is a whole other issue as it is. Um, but yeah, I think, I think, I think, uh, just everything is there's still kind of reshuffling the deck in the post COVID era. And we'll see kind of where it all kind of uh, sets out. I like your urban uh, Renaissance references and maybe next time we chat, we'll have to dive a little deeper into that and see how all of this is evolving. Yeah. I think, well, you know, I think you'll see stuff like a, a raising of an, a part of a, a dilapidated building and, and, and replenishing it or with just green space. You know th- those kind of things to kind of and, and it'll be interesting to see what cities look like twenty years, thirty years from now if they're the Definitely. same kind of just these you know hulking buildings or a place where people really are not just going there to you know to work because that's not what's going on anymore. They're not going. You know, they're not doing the nine to five. Get on the subway and get get go downtown. Hop back on the subway. Go back out to your home in the suburbs. It's like maybe these are going to there's going to be real shift there. And that's where people are going to be living. So how do you kind of repurpose everything in that regard? David, always interesting to chat with you. Thank you so much. You've been watching The Innovative Hotelier. Join us again soon for more up-to-the-minute insights and information specifically for the hotel and hospitality industry.